Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Pierce and I'm a, an American bioethicist affiliated with the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus Center for Bioethics and Humanities and um, thank you for uh, being here today. So I'm going to talk about some of the ethical issues raised by pet keeping practices. Um, this is just a, a, small, um, a small sample of what's a really broad, extremely complex area of ethical consideration. So, so here we go. Um, pet keeping is an increasingly pressing moral issue as the practice of pet keeping continues to grow in popularity around the globe and the number of animals bought sold and kept as pets, mushrooms. Millions, probably hundreds of millions of animals' lives are at stake. In the US alone, just to take one small slice of things, there are likely at least 470 million animals being kept in homes as pets. This means that the number of pet animals exceeds the number of humans. And these demographic trends are similar globally. Pet keeping practices are extraordinarily diverse and constantly evolving and run the gamut from the ethically benign to the profoundly disturbing. Nevertheless, most, and I would probably even go so far as to say almost all, pet animals experience some degree of compromised welfare, and many live under conditions more challenging than those faced by animals in industrial farming venues, laboratories, zoos, and so forth. Pet keeping practices, including the sourcing, transporting, sale, and keeping of pets are subject to far less regulatory control than other venues in which animals are used by humans. And the fact that pet animals are kept in the private sphere of the home means that their lives are mostly hidden from scrutiny. Anyone of any age can buy almost any animal they want to and can do so without any training or knowledge of the animal's environmental, nutritional, or behavioral needs. There are numerous quandaries facing the individual who decides to keep a pet. Is it ethical to own an animal in the first place and keep him or her captive in my home? How long can I leave my dog alone by herself? Should my cat be allowed outside? What is an ethical and sustainable diet for my dog or cat? Cultural pet keeping practices are also an ethical minefield, such as the practice of relinquishing unwanted or behaviorally challenging animals to shelters, the dilemma of whether killing a healthy animal is ever preferable to long-term sheltering, the sourcing of animals from commercial breeders, breeding for maladaptive traits, and the increasing popularity of exotic pets such as sloths and fennec foxes. Veterinarians are at the center of this ethical vortex. A number of factors place veterinarians there. First of all, veterinarians provide mental and physical care to these millions or hundreds of millions of animals. Second, vets are a key translator between humans and animals being helping guardians understand what animals need and how to provide for these needs, sometimes within a limited budget. Third, vets are the most trusted source of information in society about animals, and they play a large role in how people understand human-animal relations and what kind of interactions with animals are ethically acceptable. And finally, by the very nature of their work, Veterinarians are constantly thrust into the middle of ethically charged, oftentimes catastrophic situations created by a set of cultural practices over which they have very little control. Moral distress is a part of the job description. That pet keeping poses ethical problems may seem counterintuitive at first. Pets are the animals we love, 
They're the objects of affection and care. We think of them as snug in their soft little beds in a warm house with a bowl of kibble. And there is an enormous industry dedicated to their care. There are pet stores, pet food manufacturers, grooming supplies and salons, daycare centers, toys, games, enrichments, and etc. Not to mention an entire profession, all of you listening to this lecture, focused on keeping them healthy and happy. But love is not enough and good intentions don't necessarily lead to acceptable outcomes for animals. And this is what, in my mind, makes pet keeping so interesting ethically. Although we can all agree that the lives of pet animals matter, there are genuine disagreements about what constitutes a good life for an animal, specifically whether being someone's pet can be considered a good life. There are discussions about whether pet keeping turns animals into commodities and why the commodification of animals is ethically problematic, what counts as best practices, and how to bridge the gap between good intentions by pet owners and acceptable outcomes for animals, and how to identify and understand, and most importantly, alleviate the many forms of neglect and unintentional cruelty imposed by people who keep animals as companions. And I want to acknowledge that these questions are really uncomfortable. They may make us feel defensive or guilty. There's a tendency, especially within Western moral philosophical tradition, to seek answers that are yes, no, and to create binaries. So a thing is either right or it's wrong. But ethics is typically messier than this, and the ethics of keeping pets is particularly messier than this. And I think it's quite accurate to say that keeping pets is both right and not right, and that a large degree of ambivalence is, is in order. Ambivalence is not a sign of weakness or intellectual confusion. In my mind, it's a sign of nuanced, open-minded reflection. We should feel ambivalent about this. In many ways, I think that keeping animals as pets is wrong. Yet, this is Bella, my canine companion. Um, I live with her and believe I am providing her a pretty good life, yet, Part of me still feels guilty about keeping her as my pet, and I worry about the inherent asymmetries in our relationship. So pet is a socially constructed category. Any animal can be labeled a pet, even an animal who may initially have been or will eventually be labeled as something else like food. A pet is generally taken to be an animal kept in the domestic home setting whose sole function is companionship, amusement, or personal curiosity. Following this definition, some scholars argue that pet is a category of animal with no economic or utilitarian function, setting animals in pet animals into a wholly separate moral category from animals raised for food, research, hard labor, or public display. Our relationships with pets on this view are affiliative, not utilitarian, and rather than being mere things, pet animals enjoy a moral status verging on what you might call quasi-personhood. In contrast to this, I would argue that animals kept as pets are not exempt from exploitation, but rather are objectified and commodified in ways very much like animals raised for food. Pets are emotional commodities, but commodities nonetheless. Their affiliative function is a measure of their utility, of their value to us. One of the reasons I find pet keeping ethically problematic is precisely because it turns animals into things, not persons. And going into, without going into an extended detour, on the value of animal life, there are compelling scientific and moral reasons for considering all animals to have inherent moral value, 
such that using them as things should be considered morally harmful. So is it ethical to keep animals as pets? The central argument against pet keeping is simple. Pet keeping imposes harm and harming animals is wrong. There are many kinds of harm imposed by pet keeping. For example, there's direct harm to individual animals from being held captive and from compromised welfare in their care. And there are indirect harms to animals as a whole, which revolt, results from the commodification of animals, from viewing them as products or toys to consume rather than as sentient beings with lives and interests of their own. So I wanna talk for a, a few minutes about the ramifications of captivity for pet animals. Pets are not generally seen as captive animals in the same way, for example, that animals in zoos or research laboratories are. But any animal who must live most of his or her life behind bars is captive. Even dogs and cats who may have freedom to roam around the house and perhaps even the backyard are captive in important respects. They're not masters of their own lives, don't have any substantive control over their environment, their social interactions, or their daily choices. The fact that there is an entire literature dedicated to so-called captivity effects should leave us in no doubt that captivity itself is a moral problem. Captivity effects refers to the range of physical, psychological, and even neurobiological changes induced by captive conditions. And these are these are the same across from humans to mammals to, to non-mammalian species of animal. These captivity effects include long-term activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, repetitive and abnormal behaviors indicative of psychological trauma, typically called stereotypies in the animal literature, changes to immune function, brain morphology, reproductive behaviors, circadian rhythms, and so on and so on. It's important to be alert to the harms that captivity can impose um, and be aware that if we choose to have pets um, to understand and offset these harms as much as we can. And I just wanna note here that the pet industry, I think, does a, a huge disservice to animals by suggesting that um, certain captive conditions are, are acceptable. And these are just a couple of examples of products that are sold in major pet store chains in the United States. And for somebody who, who doesn't know, which is, is most of the pet owning public, um, the fact that these are marketed and sold by reputable pet companies would suggest that their use is is okay. Um, captivity, of course, is not just a black and white. It's not either or. You know, we're all captive to some degree. Um, some species will experience captivity more negatively than others. For example, wild animals will experience um, the captivity that comes with being a pet um, probably more um, significantly than a domesticated animal. Some pets are, are very obviously captive, like tigers and cages and geckos and glass tanks. Um, and some are less obviously captive, like the dogs and cats who share our homes. Some individual animals are more captive than others. Um, a dog who's kept in a crate or a kennel all the time is more intensively, more problematically captive than a dog who has full run of her house and gets to go out on excursions into the world. Um, and the same animal can experience captivity in different ways throughout um, different times of his or her life. So it's, it's fluid, um, but there are definitely um, better and worse forms of experiences of captivity. So leaving behind now the, the question of whether 
pet keeping is or is not ethical because that ship honestly has already sailed. So let's let's move into um, where we are now and um, what we can perhaps be doing better right now. So do some animals make better pets, ethically speaking, than others? Um, you know, what I just said about captivity suggests that, yeah, there probably is a kind of a schema of animals for whom captivity and um, other aspects of being held as pets will be more aversive than others. Um, so it'll depend on what kinds of burden captivity or confinement imposes and what kinds of possibilities there are for reciprocal and mutually enhancing relationships with human companions. Um, using these criteria, we might generally rank species in rough order from less ethical to more ethical. Um, we'll talk for a couple minutes about the less ethical side of things. And, you know, for me, um, the first four of the species categories that we have here on this slide, um, wild animals, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and birds are, are not ethically acceptable pets. The burdens for these animals are too great. Um, and then the others, I think it, it, it's a lot more gray. So arguably one of the most damaging and least ethically justifiable pet related practices, and this is our dark blue um, box here, is the practice of keeping wild and exotic animals as pets. There's really no, no countervailing benefit to keeping wild animals as pets, either to animals or to people, other than the staggering amount of money that some people are making by collecting, breeding, transporting, and selling wild animals. Unlike dogs or cats, exotic pets spend nearly all their time in a cage or tank because if you didn't have a cage or tank, they would run away, which tells you something about their preferences. Because they're not domesticated, they will always remain somewhat fearful in the company of humans and they have environmental and nutritional needs that are complex and that are beyond the knowledge and skills of most pet owners. And as a side note, one of the, the things that drives me most crazy here in pet stores in the US is the marketing of leopard geckos as starter pets for children um, because they're easy to care for. Um, they're not actually that easy to care for. They're easy to kill um, and mortality is pretty high. Um, but I, I think it's uh, misleading and, and cruel to label these as, as easy starter pets for children. Pet stores and internet brokers typically offer very little, if any, education for prospective pet owners. Um, and the information you find on the internet, of course, runs the gamut from very good to really bad. Um, few veterinarians treat exotic pets and even fewer exotic pet owners um, avail themselves of veterinary specialists. So pain and illness tend to go untreated Owner satisfaction with these species tends to be relatively low because per, probably because of a misalignment between owner expectations and the behavior of an animal. And going back to the leopard gecko, a child wants an animal with whom he or she can interact. Um, leopard geckos don't particularly like to be handled. So um, there, there is a significant mismatch already in the making. The welfare of exotic pets is um, often profoundly compromised and mortality rates can be quite high. One estimate suggests, for example, that at least 70% of captive reptiles will die before they reach the pet store shelves. Um, I'm sorry, these slides are a little bit disturbing, but I think it's worth, you know, worth reminding ourselves um, what pet keeping costs animals. Once those 30% um, survivors get to the pet store shelves, 
about 75% will not survive past their first year of being a, a pet. The zoo animal welfare literature might help shed some light on which species of animal might do better or less well as a pet. Species with more behavioral plasticity tend to do better in captive environments. And, you know, and dogs and cats are more behaviorally flexible than reptiles. Um, some species specific characteristics such as timidity could serve as red flags. For timid species, the presence of stimuli perceived as threatening will overactivate the endocrine stress response and these stress responses will be turned on far more than is natural or healthy. And veterinarians as a source of information about pet keeping practices should help shape consumer behaviors and attitudes toward exotics, educating the public about how exotic animals are sourced and about the challenges of providing decent welfare for these species in captivity. And I wanted to just mention two really good documentary films on the pet trade. One is called Wild Caught, which is about the, the aquarium fish trade. Um, and then the other is The Elephant in the Living Room, which is about um, exotic sort of tigers and wolves and other um, mostly large animal species being kept in backyards. Um, and that one's focused on the United States. It's, they're both worth watching. So, um, circling back now to the bottom end of the slide that I showed before and how I'll bring it back up again. Um, so the, the more ethical end of things, you know, why are, why are these animals down here and um, why are they, why are they less problematic? And uh, just a side note, I, I have cats as slightly more problematic than dogs because of the indoor outdoor cat issue, which I, I don't have any good resolution for. Um, it's, there's abundant evidence that the population of outdoor cats is, is really problematic for species of small mammal, bird, reptile, and so forth. And on the other hand, indoor only lifestyles can significantly compromise cat welfare. So that's kind of that's just a, a dilemma I'm not sure how to resolve other than just simply not keeping cats as pets, which is my own personal choice. Um, I have cats, I like cats, but I, I just won't do it. Because dogs and cats and arguably rabbits and other small animals like rats um, can live in human environments with a large measure of freedom. And because these species are domesticated and have evolved in close relationship with humans and have chosen, evolutionarily speaking, to form companionable bonds with us, they might be the most likely candidates for ethical pets. A dog, for example, might be confined to the house for part of a day, so maybe a captive animal, but nevertheless may also have ample opportunities to go outside, run free, follow her nose, and share in mutually enjoyable activities with her human, such as lounging on the couch, eating crackers, and going for a hike. And this is the schema that I developed in my book, Run, Spot, Run. Um, and, you know, in the past few years, I've started to question myself a little bit, and I'm not sure that I wouldn't take the wild animals and reptiles and fish and birds off the less ethical end of the list, but I've gotten more, a little more cynical, I think, about the possibilities for dogs and cats, um, particularly dogs. I just finished a book on the ethics of living with dogs, and my sense is that pet dogs are in crisis um, right now, and it's really not working for them very well, this, this pet keeping situation. And I think, I think the same is true for cats, but um, let's carry on. So even if we decide that um, keeping dogs and cats 
can be undertaken for ethically sound reasons. There are still an almost infinite number of ethical issues that arise in our decisions about how best to care for them. We have to decide what and how to feed, how long we can leave them alone, how much to limit their physical movements, so balancing their freedom with their safety, and figure out which behaviors we're willing to accept and which we're not, and whether what we ask behaviorally is fair. And so I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about some of the most significant welfare problems that I see facing dogs and cats. And these are, you could call them welfare problems, you could also call them ethical problems, um, which might have been better for this particular uh, lecture. So, and I'm not going to talk about what I think are the, the obvious problems that are, they're really kind of no-brainers. We, we know they're problems and they're, there's been a lot of really good discussion about them and and everybody knows their problems, like um, shelter trauma, zoophilia, outright cruelty, dog fighting, um, tethering, you know, puppy mills, commercial breeding, and so forth. So I'm going to focus on um, some of the, the issues that can come up in the context of a, a loving home with well-intentioned guardians. Um, and I think one of the most significant welfare problems faced by pet animals is boredom. They just don't have anything to do. And we think that giving them a warm bed and providing all their food and every other necessity they might need is doing them a favor, but actually um, it leaves them with nothing meaningful to do. Over the past decade or so, scientists have recognized that boredom is a particularly acute welfare risk for animals in captivity. Um, we know that animals can experience boredom in conditions similar to those under which humans experience boredom, so confinement, monotony, predictability, um, and that boredom can cause both physical and especially psychological harm. So boredom is related to, um, but was distinct from frustration, stress, depression, and apathy. A paper by Charlotte Byrne in 2017 um, on animal boredom, um, she said, chronic inescapable boredom can be extremely aversive and understimulation can harm neural, cognitive, and behavioral flexibility. Wild and domestic animals are at particular risk in captivity, which is often spatially and temporally monotonous. We can fortunately address boredom and we can do so by first of all limiting the species we keep as pets to those who can freely move around outside of cages um, and, and providing enrichments for those that we do decide to keep. Um, some examples of really boring environments, these are they're pretty easy to find. Um, and luckily, it's also very easy to find examples of much less boring environments. Um, there's a lot we can do to make the lives of companion animals more interesting. A second under-acknowledged welfare risk for pets is loneliness, um, which seems perhaps ironic because we get them um, as companions, but um, we still have lives outside the home and they do not. Many pet animals are kept as singletons, even those that are known to be highly social, like guinea pigs and rabbits. Um, loneliness is a significant problems, problem for dogs, um, as evidenced by the high number of dog owners seeking behavioral advice for separation-related behaviors. Dogs have been genetically selected for their friendliness toward us and their desire to have contact with us. So deprivation of social contact with us can be, for many dogs, a serious welfare problem. There's loose consensus that about four hours of alone time is the maximum that we should ask of our dogs. Um, a recent report in the UK found that 20% of dogs were home alone every day for at least five hours. Um, I think that actually is, is a fairly no, low number. Um, and many of these dogs are, are not just left alone, they're actually left in 
crates, which are equivalent to cages. They're just, it's just an, a euphemism. It's a nicer name. Um, and same for cats. Cats have, have long been stereotyped as aloof and solitary and not needing companionship, but new research on cat behavior is really challenging this stereotype. And there's growing concern that cats like dogs suffer from too much time alone and too much loneliness in our company. Lack of appropriate training is also uh, an indirect welfare risk for dogs and cats. Um, since these animals might not learn what humans expect from them behaviorally and will be therefore labeled bad. Um, bad in scare quotes there. Um, perhaps even more concerning is training or behavioral modification that relies on the elicitation of fear or some other aversive experience. Um, and I want to mention here one of the most interesting and also I think one of the most heartbreaking aspects of companion animal welfare and that is um, what I call the pathologizing of normal behavior, normal species specific behaviors. Um, one of the really common themes that I see in the veterinary literature is that behavioral problems are simply behaviors that human owners don't like. So um, I want to call up two articles here um, that occurred in, the, two articles that appeared in the Journal of Veterinary Medical Science. Um, so one of these is on dogs and the next one I'll show you is about cats. And um, there are two things that are interesting um, and kind of surprising. One is that, boy, people really have a lot of problems with their dogs. I mean, I think the list probably could have gone beyond 25, um, but that's a lot of problems to have. And then um, you don't need to see the details of this. I will move it past it pretty quickly. But a lot of the behaviors on this list are actually normal dog behaviors, um, like barking, um, chasing, and digging. So you know what we what we are expecting and asking of our animals isn't always easy for them to give. Um, and a similar report by the same team on feline behavioral problems. And again. There's a lot of problem problems, and um, many of them are natural cat behaviors that we just find annoying or or problematic for some reason. And you know, there's very little differentiation in the mind of pet owners between barking that's uh, going back to dogs here, barking that's normal barking and barking that's a pathology, you know, sort of obsessive compulsive compulsive barking that's a, a sign of um, psychological distress. And the number of dogs and cats perceived to have behavioral problems is um, a figure that I've seen repeated over and over and over in the literature is around 80%. So um, most people are dissatisfied with the behavior of their pet animal, which leads you to say, well, why do you have one in the first place if you really, if you really don't like, you know, if, if you don't like shedding and barking, why do you have a dog? And if you want your furniture to be pristine and not have claw marks, why do you have a cat? And those questions may sound kind of mean or offensive, but I think they're good questions. Why, why do people insist on bringing animals into their home when they're not willing to actually adapt to what those animals need? And then finally, I want to just mention a problem connected to um, the the breeding of dogs for aesthetic preference um, and or Instagram click worthiness um, and going to sticking with with dogs here for a moment um, you know we've we've gotten to a situation where pain behaviors compromised welfare are actually um, invisible to us. We've normalized um, discomfort in certain breeds of dog. We've normalized breeding disorders in brachycephalic dogs like pugs. We've normalized hip dysplasia and subluxating kneecaps. They just come along with the breed, we say. Uh, we've normalized physical malformations, um, abnormal postures, strange gaits. You know, a pug in a lazy sit with legs out to the side and not straight under the bum um, 
doesn't sit that way to be cute for Instagram. Um, he sits that way because of um, because his hips are painful. You know, pugs often um, display lip licking and fly snapping, which owners often label as cute, um, not recognizing that these are, are actually signs of pathology, of, of serious psychological or pain or psychological um, suffering. Certain, so, you know, the same thing can be said for cats who are, um, who are bred for extreme features, like very flat faces. So, um, the good news is there are a million things that we can do better. And just very briefly, because I'm over my time allotment, um, I believe that most people are, are well-intentioned when it comes to their pets. They do love them. And veterinarians can play a huge role in helping people think more critically about the implications of their daily care decisions. Um, the basic moral framework that, that I use for thinking about doing better with companion animals is the same that I would use to talk about human ethics. Um, there are two basic fundamental practices that can improve our, our, moral, our moral behavior. One is simply working and it's tirelessly. Um, it's, a, it's something that has to be uh, constantly on our minds and in our attention, um, trying to identify and reduce sources of harm. Um, in the ethics literature, the, the term that's used often is non-maleficence, but I, it's kind of fancy. I don't think there's any reason to use that. And then the practice of kindness, which again, like non-harm, is a, it's a habit that we have to um, ingrain through constant, repeated, daily attention to, to what we're doing and helping other people draw attention to what they are doing. Um, a couple of ways in which we can apply non-harm and kindness very briefly. Um, I think paying greater attention to the, the aversive experiences of animals in our homes and in our lives um, and not downplaying or, or laughing at um, a dog for finding a, a floor, a slippery floor scary. I mean, it actually is scary. It's not, it's not a joke. Um, and um, doing what we can to alleviate sources of fear and making, um, making our homes not landscapes of fear, um, but landscapes of pleasure and enrichment. There are a lot of things we can do to um, pay attention to the inner lives of our animals and just give them more choice, more positive experiences. And it's, again, it's, it takes daily work, um, but it, it, it's very accessible to us. Um, some examples here of really creative things people do, a wonderful catio, I wanna live there. Um, this is a sensory garden that was built for dogs another, an indoor cat environment that looks pretty appealing. And then another sensory garden for dogs, which um, I would like. I think increasing agency for animals is, is really um, a really accessible way to make their lives better. They live in, um, in a setting where most of their daily choices are controlled by somebody else. And that's stressful. And there are easy ways to allow them to make choices for themselves um, and have more agency. You know, something as simple as when you go for a walk with a dog, letting them choose the direction of travel and the pace and, you know, how long you're going to stop and sniff a particular spot um, gives them, I mean, why not? And it, it gives them enjoyment to, to make choices um, for themselves. 
and this is a kind of an obvious one, but I think worth mentioning um, because at least in the United States, punishment-based training is so ingrained in the way people interact with dogs, also cats, um, so ingrained that people don't even recognize something like a shake can or a spray bottle as an aversive. Um, so I, I think that um, more education from veterinarians about about what an aversive experience is and um, how to train without those would be a huge benefit to animals. And then finally, um, I think many of I, many of you are probably um, well on board with this, but one of the main sources of, of psychological trauma in the lives of pet animals, which oddly occurs in the course of us trying to do good for them, um, is what happens in the veterinary clinic, um, particularly the use of physical restraint, which is known to have all kinds of psychological um, sequelae, um, like depression and anxiety and feeling um, a loss of, loss of control. And the fear-free movement has shown us what's possible. And um, I think embracing that would be uh, a, a wonderful, accessible way to improve the lives of companion animals. And um, just to briefly wrap up where I've been, so, and this is, as I said at the beginning, just a totally scratching the surface. Um, there's so much to say, and it's such a rich area of, of um, consideration and an area where I think it's really important to, and hopefully I haven't sounded judgmental, I think it's really important to approach these issues without judgmentalism because people really are, um, either they don't know or they're doing their best. And um, when I look back on my own experiences as a pet owner, boy, <laughs> there's a lot to, there's a lot to criticize about myself and about the way I've done things. And even though I've tried hard and been conscientious, it's a learning process. And um, so I talked about which species of, of animal make um, better pets, ethically speaking. Um, I talked only a little bit about ethical sourcing, but um, particularly in relation to wild and exotic animals, um, it's, it's a major welfare welfare red flag. And then just paying better attention to what the home environment is like for the animals who share this space with us. And, you know, typically we design our homes for us, but um, we can, I think, go a long way toward um, designing our homes and lives in ways that are co-adaptive, collaborative, and that, that involve compromise and um, what veterinarian Karen overall calls negotiated settlements with animals. Um, and that makes everybody happier. So with that, I will sign off and thank you very much for listening.